Regards, and welcome to Ryan Rambles You to Rest, a sleep podcast. I am he, and I am here now to gently talk you off to a restful transition from your waking day. On this episode, I have for you some rambles respectively on topics of runty relevance, such as the roundup of vegetables I know, a really random topic, which will actually be determined at random, and the scroll of recent photos of benches on my Instagram feed. Before we begin, I would like to recommend that you subscribe to this show on your podcast platform of choice, or YouTube. For news and announcements, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, at Ryan Rambles Pod, or follow me, at Anvil1 on Twitter. Our soundtrack is by Disparition. For the roundup, I have been requested to list all of the vegetables I know. To be sporting, I won't be able to access the internet while I go through them. I am sure that I know quite a few more vegetables from experience and on site than I do by memory and by name. So perhaps this list will be brief, and before long we will be over to the really random topic for this episode. I think I should preface this by saying that I am a big fan of vegetables. I eat them every day and am endlessly impressed by the bold, bright, and beautiful flavors that come from such a large variety of things that can be grown out of the dirt with just some sunshine and water. We are so lucky to have such a bountiful source of nutrition and flavors that can be cultivated and supplied around most of the planet. I will add that I do quite a lot of cooking with vegetables and alternative proteins. My partner is vegetarian, which pretty much makes me vegetarian, as Jules Winfield said in Quentin Tarantino's popular 90s drama Pulp Fiction. This background in home cooking is going to make the experience of naming vegetables and forgetting most of them, and probably naming a few non-vegetables, all the more embarrassing for me. Hopefully you will be unconscious for most of this ordeal. Now then, without further rambling, let's round up my list of vegetables. Number one, onions. There are a lot of varieties of onions. In fact, I probably couldn't name them all, but I'll try to name a few off the top of my head. White onions, yellow onions, green onions, Maui onions, pearl onions, large sweet onions, shallots, and then I suppose many things that are basically onions, chives, leeks, and things of that nature. I'm sure I'm forgetting many. There's a variety that I think was onions that I had in a bowl of soup in Vietnam many years ago that I've been trying to track down for a very long time and I don't know the name of. And I think those were onions. They were like shallots or red onions in color, like a little purple, but also a bit gray and maybe like spotty or leopard print almost, and they were very thinly shaved or mandolined in such a way that they were just almost paper thin and were part of the garnish for a soup that I had from, I believe it was the lunch lady, 
the woman known as the lunch lady. She was in an episode of Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations, and it wasn't too hard to find her in Vietnam. Her restaurant was basically just on a street corner. It was on sort of like a concrete island that was at like a triangle intersection, and there were just all these small tables, everything in, uh, especially in uh, Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City is those very short tables with very tiny stools. It wasn't far from the zoo, and we were wandering around corner and corner and down street and down street until we came across it, and it was pretty obvious when we found it that we had come to the right place. And when we got there, we were not sure what to say or how to order, because it was probably our second day in Vietnam, but we got, we just got waved over and plopped at a table, and then they just started bringing us the food. It, every They knew why we were there. They knew that we were Western tourists who had likely seen the restaurant on television, and they sat us down and brought over a big plate of condiments. If you've had pho in the United States, you've gotten a plate of condiments, but this was piled high with things. And as I said, one of those things was this very thinly sliced and almost like entangled, like you'd unravel it like an accordion, shallot-like thing. And it's a bit of a digression, but the soup itself was also very hearty, full of all kinds of different things, including cubes of congealed blood, but it was very tasty. And I would recommend if you have the occasion and find yourself in Vietnam, and in particular Ho Chi Minh City, to go and see the lunch lady. And also go to the zoo. The zoo is actually quite fun. We went there, and there was a white tiger, and there were also neighborhood cats. Neighborhood cats had snuck into the zoo and would just hang out with the other animals. And that's something you don't see usually in the United States. And at the White Tiger, there was a family there with their kid. And the family was more excited by my hair than the White Tiger, which was something I simply couldn't comprehend. There was this magnificent, beautiful, white-haired cat, and then me, a sweaty, lanky American with, you know, admittedly long hair and, you know, blonde dreadlocks at the time. I don't have those anymore. But they were more interested in pointing out my hair to the child than they were at the cat. And it, perplexed me at the time, although it's not the only time in my life that I've traveled abroad and had people look at my hair. It also happened to me when I was younger, and I went to Mexico for the first time. I was on the bus with my mom in Acapulco. I forget where we were going. I think we might have been coming back from getting lunch. And then there were these two ladies sitting behind me that couldn't resist touching my hair. At the time, I had long blonde hair, or longish blonde hair. This doesn't have very much to do with onions, I suppose. So maybe we should get back to the onions. It's hard to think about many recipes that don't include onions. Onions are so universal, it's hard to imagine food without them. So many dishes have onions. It would probably be easier to list the dishes without onions. Even when you don't know that they're in there. Onions are often cooked down and pureed and lost in a mixture. It's a little too early in this process to declare them the most important vegetable. But they are very important. They bring lots of bold flavor. And you find them all over the world. 
in pretty much every cuisine. I can't think of a particular genre even of food that I've tried that didn't have onions. I think that's particularly interesting because if you travel outside of your home country you'll find that there are forms of produce, fruits and vegetables, throughout the world that simply aren't grown or imported or exported to your home region. You'll find all kinds of things you've never tried before. But onions are really everywhere. It's understandable too because they're so versatile. They can be eaten raw, they can be sautéed, they can be fried. I'm a big fan of the classic cheeseburger. And it's not so much about having onions on the cheeseburger, which I do think is okay, especially if they're grilled. But I love to have onion rings as a side with my cheeseburger. I'm often more inclined to judge a cheeseburger place on its onion rings than its fries. There's so many different ways to do french fries that it might be hard to compare one place to another, but an onion ring is pretty much an onion ring everywhere, with very subtle differences. I mentioned a little earlier the versatility of onions in all the different ways you can cook them, but it's also worth pointing out that they change quite a lot in flavor depending on how you prepare them. A raw onion it can be bright, it can be spicy, then a lightly sautéed onion as it starts to get translucent can be still a little toothsome, but sweet and a little greasy. When they get completely translucent, they become something that can complement the other flavors of a, of a well-cooked dish. And then even further, once they're caramelized, they bring bitterness and uh, maybe even more sweetness. I also mentioned earlier that there are these other varieties that don't quite fit with the regular onions, like leeks, green onions, and chives in particular, and they have almost a completely different use from the regular onions we think of when a recipe calls for an onion. Oftentimes, uh, chives and green onions are a garnish and add a little bit of a hint of a spring flavor. And then leeks have even more differing usage, um, maybe even most popularly in potato leek soup. Obviously, it would be possible to talk about onions for a very long time. But since I am listing vegetables I know without using the internet, it might be a good idea to move on from onions and get to the next vegetable. Do you like onions? What are your favorite dishes with onions? Let me know. Well, the onion is probably a tough act to follow and it's difficult one to challenge on the level of diversity and variety. But I think a good follow-up anyway is peppers or chilies. Capsicum, if you will. There are so many varieties that it's hard to think of them all. Of course, here in the United States we are most familiar with the green bell pepper and the red bell pepper, and in some places, the jalapeno pepper. But beyond that, there are quite a few other varieties. There are yellow bell peppers, and orange bell peppers in particular that I've been seeing a lot of lately. There are all sorts of varieties of smaller, sweet and hot peppers of each of those colors I just mentioned. If you go to a farmer's market, you might also find on occasion purple bell peppers. Like onions, bell peppers are pretty fantastic in that they are super good raw, and they cook well, and they really do change flavor quite a lot. 
in particular the green bell pepper. It has a very different flavor when it's raw versus when you cook it and it gets more bitter and more umami in flavor. The green bell pepper, honestly, is probably the only one I really knew about for the longest time when I was younger. It's definitely a crucial ingredient to some of the recipes I grew up with, including the very trashy taco salad that my friends know and enjoy for Super Bowl Sunday, and also the spaghetti sauce that my mom passed down to me. You know, I haven't made that spaghetti sauce in a long time. It's more of a stew, and I probably haven't made it in over a year. I like it quite a lot, and it's one of the reasons why I love spaghetti so much. And it's also one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of ordering it at restaurants. Don't get me wrong, I like a lot of different pastas, and especially things that are stuffed like ravioli or tortellini, which are hard to make at home. I like to order those out. But spaghetti, just working with dried spaghetti, often I find that a simple sauce doesn't quite do it, and the sauce from my mom is very hearty. Originally, it's full of ground beef, onions, which we've talked about, bell peppers, which we've talked about, and quite a lot of tomato sauce. The sneaky substitution, if you're doing meat, is to put in a ground sausage instead of a ground beef. It adds a little bit of extra savoriness or spiciness or sweetness, depending on the ground sausage that you use. But I haven't made it with meat in probably over 10 years. I've gotten into cooking quite a lot with fake meats, and because my partner is vegetarian, it's become a mission and a pleasure to learn how to make some of my favorite childhood recipes, including the spaghetti sauce and the taco salad, meat-free. The last time I definitely remember making it was for my 40th birthday. We had a get-together up the coast, and there were several people, and I got to make this sauce for all of my friends, which was actually very exciting. I hadn't cooked for that many of my friends before. Maybe the next biggest group I had cooked for was making the aforementioned taco salad for Super Bowl Sunday. In any case, for me, the spaghetti sauce is a real comfort food. And it reminds me of growing up, and something that I've made pretty much throughout my life. So it's just very comforting to me, and familiar. I'm thinking, of, boy, now I'm really craving it right now. It's kind of good for all seasons, although it is maybe more of a winter dish. And it's easy to make in large batches, which I like because it means I can freeze it, and then... Whenever I'm feeling like having spaghetti or need some kind of comfort food, I can just heat some up. It lasts a very long time in the freezer, so a good-sized batch can go a long way. And it takes away the need for keeping around jars of pre-made sauce for when you're not in the mood to do a homemade sauce. Okay, let's get back to peppers before this goes on too long. So while red and green bell peppers are definitely among the most common in our grocery stores, I do need to shout out the yellow and orange. Lately around here we've been getting very juicy, very flavorful yellow and orange bell peppers, and I actually prefer them to the red and green when it comes to raw. They're actually very good, diced very finely as a topping for tacos, for example. They add a brightness and a little bit of natural crunch that really comes together with whatever else you want to put in there that might be cooked a little bit more heartily. You'll also often find varieties of smaller sweet peppers, and they can be very good, but these yellow and orange ones we've been getting lately really do outdo everything. 
There are, of course, epic varieties of hot peppers as well, from the jalapeno all the way up to the mighty ghost pepper. I do love spicy food, but as I've gotten older, it's harder and harder for me to survive it. It's still delicious, and I still enjoy eating it, but it does play havoc on my insides now. That said, one of my favorite things about hot chilies is their almost universality. You can go to a lot of countries throughout the world and you'll find spicy food, and a lot of that heat comes from chili peppers. In particular, some of my favorite cuisines almost depend on it, including a lot of food from Southeast Asia and Latin foods as well as Italian. I used to curate a pretty good collection of bottled hot sauces as well. Since it hurts my stomach now, I don't keep as much track of it as I should, but I do have an okay variety, and I always like to try new hot sauces from anywhere I go. It's one thing you can find just about everywhere, and usually the bottles are pretty small so they pack in the luggage okay. My favorite from our travels that we found was Maya Ik, which was common on the table in Guatemala. I'm not sure if the company is still around since I haven't been able to find it for some time. We got it once online, but haven't seen it since. My favorite that we can find where I live pretty easily is from El Yucateco. Their black variety of hot sauce is my favorite. It may be the least spicy of their kinds between the red, the very bright green, and the Cajun or Caribbean one. But it's super smoky and I like to put it on just about anything that has a tortilla involved. I think if I had to pick a favorite though, I would say it's the Aji Amarillo pepper which you'll find in South America, in particular in Peru. In Peruvian cuisine it's often used to make an, an aioli type of sauce that's yellow with um, all kinds of good flavors and herbs mixed into it, and you've maybe even had it before without realizing it. I've been to a couple of restaurants that have like a salsa bar and they'll sneak one of these in there. It's usually quite creamy and if it's served on its own it'll be served with plantain chips and that is just an amazing combination. I love it. And also with the Peruvian cuisine you'll get the rocoto pepper which is, um, I think, maybe a little hotter, but in any case, you'll get them both sometimes mixed together, and they're really delicious. What I learned from trying to recreate the ahi amarillo sauce that I fell in love with in Peru was finding out that you don't get pepper-forward sauces very often in general. And so that got me into exploring more, particularly with my you know, personal issues of not being able to eat very spicy food anymore. And I learned that if you want to make a pepper sauce out of green or red or any of those other milder bell peppers, you can still get that flavor in the sauce without too much of the heat. And if you want to have the heat in that sauce, you can cut it with ahi amarillo if you're able to get your hands on it or even another pepper sauce of your choosing, and you can still have that pepper-forward flavor. I think in the interest of giving enough time to other vegetables, this will be enough for peppers. But I'd like to know what your favorite pepper is, or pepper-based food. So we've already talked about the onion and the pepper and it's definitely taken some time. Now I know quite a few more vegetables than just these two. However, in the interest of time, and some of our other topics, 
such as the random topic for this episode and the scroll of benches on Instagram, I think we'll leave it here for now with the vegetables, and we can pick it up at a later date in another episode. I look forward to the next time that we can talk about more vegetables. What are your favorite vegetables? Do you have dreams about them? Let's get into our really random topic for the episode. Now this topic is unscripted and unknown to myself before recording. I do not know what I am about to talk about. And so yeah, there's a chance that I will not know anything about the subject. Now let's see. For this episode, I am using CapitalizeMyTitle.com's Random Topic Generator and Conversation Starter. Now let's click the button and see what we get. Oh, well this is apropos. Our random topic is, what do you like to do to relax? Relaxation can definitely be a difficult thing to do these days. The pandemic has had a lot of people stressed out, and relaxation is at a premium when we can't spend very much time among friends and family. So a lot of relaxation has to do with what you can do alone, and what you can do with your significant other if you have one, or roommates if you have them, and it's very limited compared to the way it was before, because we can't go out. What I like to do to relax now versus what I like to do to relax in the before times are probably different things. I mean, I think I like to do the things I do now then, but I miss doing the things then. One of my favorite things to do is go to the movies, and we can't really do that now. Although maybe with the vaccine around the corner, we'll be able to go to the movies again, and I look forward to that very much, assuming that the movies stay open. So, what do I like to do to relax? Well, it's kind of a tough question to answer because there's different reasons for making an effort to relax. And this is the implication that there is an effort, something you do. There's a implied verb here. So it's not particularly passive either. One of the things I like to do to relax is play video games. They can be simultaneously energizing and exciting, but at the same time disengaging from the things that cause a great deal of stress. So if there's something that's really stressing me out, like the work I'm doing or something else outside of work, well, a uh, video game is a good distraction because it, it demands almost all of your attention when you play a video game. And I play a lot of uh, relatively violent first-person shooters. And even though they're very kinetic and loud and not at all relaxing in content, um, it relaxes me. It, it it takes away the stress that I'm feeling at the time. I don't know if that's precisely relaxation, because it's also something I will do uh, when I find that I'm getting sleepy. I might play a game to stay awake, to keep my attention and my, my brain working. 
but I do find it relaxing. And I will say that there are some games that are actually quite relaxing. My partner and I play the extremely popular game Minecraft. If you haven't played Minecraft, you should give it a shot. I was very skeptical myself for a very long time. But once you sit down to play it, you find that it's extremely relaxing. There isn't very much stress, and what stress there is, is very minor. There are enemies in the game, but they're very infrequently encountered. In fact, only at night, or only supposed to be at night. And when you encounter them, they're usually easy to either run away from or to destroy if they are somewhere that you don't want them to be. And then the other part of it is that there's no real story or goal, so it really carries that emergent gameplay where the story evolves out of what you do, not what you are told to do. And there's a building element. So for me, what I like to do is build things. And it's fun to construct large structures, even though it's a very blocky looking game. If you've seen it before, everything is very pixelated and, and aesthetic. Even so, it can be very soothing to build houses and castles and other buildings and there's just enough functionality to the gameplay that you can build things with a purpose such as for storage or a farm or a garden or um, a place to keep animals because the animals have a function and it has very relaxing music but one of the things I like about it is that I can turn off the music and put on my own music. I can put on a record or play something off of the internet. And that adds an extra layer of relaxation of being able to choose the soundtrack. And similar to even the violent first-person shooters, the, the amount of attention that you pay to playing the game really does sort of make the rest of the stress wash away. The other thing I like about video games is being able to play with friends online. This is especially valuable in this time where we can't see each other in person. And it's nice to, uh, on any given evening, be able to take time out with people that you know and participate in playing video games together because you get to socialize a bit and talk to each other and then use that game to entertain you both but also take your mind off of whatever else might be stressing you out. And that actually extends to gaming in general, not just video games, but tabletop games, role-playing games. These are also things that are traditionally done in person and are definitely harder to do online. But it is possible to play both role-playing games and board games online. There is a board game simulator on Steam, and that actually has many of the board games that you're familiar with playing at a table uh, built into it, um, even obscure games. And it's basically just a virtual table with a virtual board and all of the cards and pieces that you're used to playing the games with. It's not even very much of a video game. It's almost like just virtual reality. And that's something you can do with friends. And then there's Roll20, which is the 
online platform that is probably best for Dungeons and Dragons. But it has many, many other uh, role-playing games built into it. However, those other games, unless there are a few specific titles, aren't very well supported. It's primarily for Dungeons and Dragons, I would say. I was running a Cyberpunk 2020 campaign before the pandemic began. And when the pandemic began, I thought about trying to move that game into an online space but it's very hard to get all of the things that you want into the platform itself and then all of the mechanics of rolling dice again for games that aren't Dungeons and Dragons definitely have some weak points and some struggles and you have to bring in things like maps and character tokens but that said if you're willing to do it there's a way to do it. Something else I like to do to relax is drive. As far as forms of transportation go, I find driving to be especially meditative. And it's a good way to get a lay of the land in and around where you live. Especially if where you live is pretty spread out. Now, I live in a city, so I don't really need driving for utility as much as for recreation. And I absolutely love renting a car and just driving as far as you can. You can get a pretty long way in a day of driving, and you can see a lot of different things. There's always new landscapes to encounter, new towns and new foods, new places to stay. And you get to see how people live and work in other places. But it's really the open road. Like being on a freeway and having a destination that's a long way off. The longer the drive, the better for me. Get some music going or a podcast. And on you go. We tend to go on a few drives each year that take us around the state of California and sometimes other places. In fact, almost everywhere we go, driving is baked into the plan somewhere. And it's a very freeing type of thing if you're away from home, but you also have the ability to drive. It's great because you can really control the pace of your travel and your experience. You can stop places whenever you feel like it because you see a restaurant or a roadside fruit stand or something like that. It really is about the road trip. Getting packed up, sometimes with camping gear, with plans of going pretty far away. It's a great way to take in the vastness of mountains or open desert or canyons. Or even just boring industrial roadway. There's a lot of it out there. I don't eat an awful lot of fast food when I'm at home, 
But that's another treat that comes with the road trip is sometimes getting Taco Bell or Burger King or something like that on the road. It's a guilty pleasure. It's also a great way to be able to get out and see nature. There aren't many other forms of transportation that afford you as much access as driving does. And where I live, you definitely have to drive if you want to see the biggest and most beautiful parts of nature that the state has to offer. And here there are a lot of national parks to visit, as well as plenty of state parks that are pretty beautiful. And then there's the question of what's the best vehicle? And the best vehicle is going to be different depending on where you're going or how long you're going for. And I like a range of different options. But one thing I like a lot is a good compact convertible. We've rented several times a Mini Cooper convertible and that's about perfect for driving around the windy Northern California roads. If it's a super long drive though, I like to have something a little bit bigger, a little roomier, something in a four-wheel drive and SUV situation. I always like to raise the seat up as high as it goes and get as far off the ground as possible. And maybe because I drive so many different cars because we don't own a car and it's always rentals or car share type things, then I don't really get too deep into the different features that newer vehicles have. The main thing I want the most in terms of modern technology is the ability to connect my phone to the car so I can play music or a podcast. Outside of that, though, everything else seems to be kind of an annoyance. A lot of these cars, when you get in them, they have all kinds of alarm systems and features that tell you when you're going off the road or when there's a car that's too close to you. And about half the time those things are going off when there's no problem at all. We borrowed a car recently where there was a warning on the digital dashboard that the wiper fluid was out and the warning came up with a tone every minute. It was pretty obnoxious. But I would be curious to know if folks out there have key modern features that they like. Whether that's entertainment related or related to the function of the car, I'd be curious because I don't pay much attention to that stuff. The other good thing about taking a car is that you get a lot of space. You can pack a lot of things for different weather or for different activities. And, you know, if you've just got two people like we normally do, then you can also fit a cooler in the back and have plenty of cold drinks and snacks available. It's hard, though, to describe exactly why I would consider it something I like to do to relax, except that it is something of a meditative experience. There's a lot of audio and visual stimulation, and it allows you to sort of zone out a little bit. And if it's not meditative, then it's also like a constant learning. You're finding out more about different places as you travel to them. And we like to often look things up as we're passing them, maybe historic locations or buildings that look interesting or types of industry that we drive past and find out more about where we are. And along the way, you learn a little bit more about the country or the city or the state that you live in. It also has a 
good variety of pace. Sometimes it's a long, slow, smooth drive on a freeway with not much going on. And then other times it's a misty night on windy mountain roads that seem to go on forever. It's definitely not something that you can do easily on a whim. This is definitely like things that we have to plan in advance and make a lot of arrangements for. So it's definitely, in terms of things I do to relax, not something that you might just do after you get off work or on a Saturday afternoon. Although sometimes it's a Saturday afternoon. I still somehow have only driven inside the United States, though. Most of the time when we travel abroad, we have arrangements such that we're getting around mostly with planes, trains, and automobiles, and usually not driving any of those. Even though I'd like to think I'd be pretty good at driving a train, you just follow the, the tracks. But I would like to, at some point, challenge myself a little bit more about driving in another country. Although, I guess what I like about taking other forms of transportation is that it's easier as a passenger to really take in a lot of the details around you that do tend to get lost when you're the one behind the wheel. And without having done it, I definitely have an amount of nervousness about driving in any country where they drive on the other side of the road than where we do in the United States. Although really that's just a handful of countries. One more thing I like to do to relax is really spend time in the kitchen. And it doesn't really matter what I'm doing. Like, I don't mind if I'm just in there doing dishes, or cleaning up, or cooking something, or eating something. But I like to spend time in the kitchen. Especially when it's a bit activity-focused, because I can put on a lengthy podcast and really just go into a sort of kitchen fugue. Pretty much every day I take half an hour to an hour to clean the kitchen and listen to podcasts. Usually that involves doing a large amount of dishes and cleaning the surfaces and the stove and things. And sometimes that involves taking out the garbage. And it almost always begins with making coffee. And if you're a long-time listener of the podcast, then you know that I recently got a new coffee grinder to assist in the process of making the coffee that kicks off every day the act of cleaning the kitchen. Now, I do have additional insights and thoughts about that coffee grinder since we last talked about it but I think I'm going to save those for another time when it might be more fitting to update. In any case, it always starts with making coffee. Although, I guess if I'm to be completely honest, it starts with a few other things I've already talked about too. Which is usually I start the day with the David Lynch weather report and listen to that as I'm sort of gathering things to be cleaned. And then, to be completely honest, I probably microwave one cup of yesterday's coffee to get things started while I'm waiting for water to boil. It definitely takes some patience to wait for the coffee, and I don't always have it in the morning when I'm still tired. But then it's on to doing the dishes, 
And I find that relaxing because I've got sort of a system for it. I've gotten used to cleaning things in a certain order, make sure the sharp things are out of the way, have a certain way of stacking on the dryer because we don't have a dishwasher. And I like to think that I've gotten pretty good at it. So there's a little bit of taking pride at the end of it as well. It's also very satisfying because it means that the kitchen's ready to go. I make sure that everything that needs to be refilled is refilled, such as salt containers, salt grinder, pepper grinder, olive oil, and we have a lot of different olive oils. We've probably got on the counter by the stove seven different oils of which most of them are olive oil there's a vegetable oil in there too but I make sure all of those things are filled and dish soap probably and then it's just nice to know that when it's time to be inspired to cook everything's clean and set up and ready for the next adventure and cooking really is a great thing. Another one I like to put on a podcast and just sort of get lost in the process. As much as it can be a little nerve-wracking to try a recipe for the first time or worry about if you're getting something right, there's still quite a lot of cooking where you're just in the process. In particular, as we work with a lot of vegetables, like we talked about earlier in this episode, there's a lot of mise en place to be taken care of, which is easily what takes the most amount of time in general when you're cooking. Unless you're doing something that really needs to rest or marinate or rise, just chopping things is really what takes the most time. And sometimes it's nice to have a good podcast and maybe a beer going while you do it. Although it's not as relaxing as cooking or cleaning, organizing the kitchen too can be a good sort of relaxing process if you have a bit of a vision or a mission in mind. Like if you want to organize the pantry, get your spices in orders, or your canned goods, or your dry goods. Or if you just want to move some tools around, get some things in different drawers, make things more handy. The kitchen itself is really just a pretty cool place. One last thing I'll add in the question of what do you like to do to relax is I'll add reading. We recently purchased some e-readers and over our last vacation we're able to really spend time relaxing and reading. And it's really hard to understate the maybe ultimate relaxingness of having a good chair or couch or arrangement of pillows in bed to set you up for a good bit of reading. And I have to say furthermore, that the e-reader for me is a real game changer. The one I got, which is a Kobo, connects to the library, so you can almost on a whim and for free borrow books that you might not otherwise pick up or that you definitely wouldn't spend money on. It's also supposedly able to uh, attribute your book purchases to a bookseller of your choice. And that was one of the main reasons that I got the Kobo in particular, because I wanted to support the local bookstore while still being able to read books digitally. Now, unfortunately, there isn't a very good way of verifying whether your purchases were properly attributed to your bookstore. And I've tried to figure out if there's any way to verify whether your purchase went to the right place 
but so far I haven't found anything out. I tried contacting the bookstore, and I tried contacting Kobo, and I didn't get any information from them. The bookstore just said that they get a lump sum from Kobo every month and don't have an itemized receipt. Kobo never got back to me, and then the purchase receipt themselves don't have anything. That said, it's a good thing to be able to support your local bookstore, and it's nice to be able to use your library at the same time. And what I really like about it is that I can have a number of books at my fingertips all at once, and I try to have a little bit of an assortment that'll fit whatever mood I'm in when I'm sitting down, but not too many options. At any given time, I think it's nice to have something funny, something serious in probably a non-fiction direction, something thoughtful in a maybe philosophy direction, and then something that's more pulpy, just there for your entertainment, like a exciting science fiction novel, for example. Perhaps if folks feel like they would like to hear another instruction manual, I could read the one for the Kobo Clara HT e-reader. So those are some things that answer the question, what do you like to do to relax? And I brought up going to the movies, video games and gaming in general, driving or going on road trips, spending time in the kitchen, and reading. If you enjoyed this topic from CapitalizeMyTitle.com's Random Topic Generator and Conversation Starter, go to CapitalizeMyTitle.com forward slash random dash topic dash generator forward slash. Now for the scroll. This is the point where it's almost time for me to sign off, but before I do, I'm going to browse the internet until I'm sleepy. For this scroll, I'm going to head over to Instagram once again to enjoy photographs of benches from around the world. Since the last installment, I've added some new friends, so we may have some benches from surprise new parts of the world. I will try not to get too excited. Please join me as I will describe photographs of several fine benches. If you could, help me to keep track of how many we see. Number one, from Beautiful World of Benches. This with underscores to tie those words together. They have uh, presented for us a uh, rustic looking wood bench that is sitting on a piece of grass that is not very lush. It's very short grass and not very well kept. Like it looks, like you can see patches of dirt and some weedy type flowers growing, little white ones. And it's got notches in the back post uh, that look like they would maybe have been put there with a knife, but they aren't like graffiti either. So I'm not sure what's going on there. And uh, there's also on this bench a uh, brass dedication plate that we can't see the, the writing on because it's pretty small for a dedication plate. And even if it was a large one, I don't think I could read it at this distance. It's taking up a good chunk of the bottom half of the frame. And it's positioned underneath a tree which is planted behind it. And we can only just see the bottom, like, one branch of the tree that's providing uh, 
borderline useless shade to the very edge of the bench on the left side. Then behind that, uh, behind the, the back post of the bench is also a almost completely barren shrub that doesn't have any flowers on it. And then behind that, uh, taking up most of the rest of the frame, is a maybe one-story barn-type building. It looks to have a tiled red roof and a vertic vertical wooden slats that make up the wall that we can see. And at the very edge, at the very left edge of the frame, there appears to be perhaps a handle on a door that is almost cleverly hidden in all the slatting of the of the wall. And it appears that there is a bit of a maybe gravel walkway going up to that door, but the photograph is really framed to favor the bench and not give us much of a sense of the building. It might not be a barn. It could be the back side of a rest stop bathroom, for example. Although that doesn't sound as appealing as a barn. And for all of the barren kind of nature of the the tree and the and the bench has kind of a barren, almost unwelcoming quality. The the very the small amount of sky we can see above this barn is actually blue with some wispy clouds and actually looks rather nice. And the shadows being cast are on the harder side. So even though it's uh, not beautiful grass and plants. It doesn't seem like the weather at the time of the photography is unpleasant. And I should probably add that there's a... Uh, the, the legs of this bench are very thick rectangular blocks. The, the back post and the bench itself for sitting are like split log style uh, aesthetic, but the the actual posts of the bench are heavier wood blocks. It doesn't really line up aesthetically, but it does look like it's a sturdy bench from here. Well, that's our first bench. I don't think there's very much to add to this one. The muted colors look nice in the photo. Our next bench comes from Park Benches, also with an underscore to denote two different words. This bench is located at Queen Victoria Gardens, which is in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, this photo is about bench level on what appears to be a uh, red gravel walkway, perhaps recently rained upon. There are a couple of small yellow dry leaves on the ground and there's a little bit of extra moisture around them. And the bench is center frame and it's a relatively standard looking park bench. The um, edges, the, the, the armrest and the legs are all uh, made of a green painted metal and then uh, the back and sitting area of the bench and the, the seat itself are uh, horizontal wooden slats, uh, thin horizontal wooden slats. There's maybe uh, nine or ten on the back, and they are uh, bolted to the frame. So it's not an especially elegant bench, and it looks well-worn. Like, it, it looks to be uh, like the paint's wearing a little bit. This bench has been here for a while. 
and there is no dedication. Now, on the other hand, surrounding the bench is a uh, row of bushes. The, the edge of the path has got a, a stone border of about maybe a foot or two high, and the bench itself is recessed off of the walkway. And then along the, the stone uh, is uh, low shrubbery, which is flowering some kind of red flower on it. And then another row behind that shrubbery is uh, another green type of grass, tall grass, but with um, purple flowering on the tips, like little, like highlights. And that sort of separates the foreground from the deeper background. In the deeper background, you can see um, presumably the, the sort of beauty of Queen Victoria Gardens. There are some, there are some additional bushes, palm trees, uh, light posts along the way, and then in the very far background, there's a monument uh, with big Corinthian pillars and uh, statues on each of the faces of the monument. It's like a, uh, it's like a tall rectangular monument with the pillars at each corner. And the, the monument is a sort of white marble looking monument, but the pillars are actually a deeper brown, like from here, maybe they're granite. It's hard to tell because it's not the biggest part of the frame. And then atop the monument is a statue of a woman in a gown, perhaps Queen Victoria. And at her feet, on each of the four corners of the rectangle, are also uh, tiny little lion statues. The kind you see on the New York Public Library featured in Ghostbusters. At least that's what I always think of when I see those lions. They're probably from somewhere else in Europe. The colors of this image are rather muted, and it looks as though there's probably been an Instagram filter applied to this to give it uh, that, a little bit of a washed out look. The sky isn't completely overcast, there's bits of blue peeking out, and there aren't any hard shadows, so so it could be a flat, overcast kind of day, but it still seems like it should be a little bit brighter and more colorful. The next photo is not from a friend on Instagram, but from the hashtag benches of Instagram. This one is from FRPT lady and it's of Ollie's Pond Park. Ollie's being a plural, not a possessive. I don't know where that is. Well, here is a park bench that is off the beaten path. It is very close to the edge of the water of presumably Ollie's Pond. And it's really just a utility bench. It doesn't have very much class at all. It is, uh, its legs are a uh, single post in the rear, Y-shaped posts where the upper part of the Y supports the back and the more vertical part of the Y supports the seat of the bench. And it's just a metal uh, pole. Nothing fancy, just round cylindrical metal, and then the bench itself is just two wood planks that look like they were probably finished but some time ago, and are just bolted in place, so not very nice. 
And it's also not on a path. It's off the path, and there is a bit of unkept grass all around it, leading up to the edge of the pond. And directly in front of the bench is dirt, where uh, presumably people's feet have just worn out the growing grass from sitting there and shuffling about. Now, if you were sitting in the bench, the next feature would be to your left, but here in the perspective of the photo, it is sticking right up from the center of the bench, and there is a sign. And let's see if I can read it. It says, Caution. And I can't read the rest of the words, but there is a shape of probably a dangerous animal. And it looks like that animal might be an alligator or a crab. It's very hard to see because it's the sign is almost flat to the lens. Or I should say perpendicular to the lens. Um, well, maybe if we look up Ollie's Pond Park another time, we can find out what Ollie's Pond Park has in it to be concerned about if you're sitting on the bench. Now behind that, or further along, there is the pond, and uh, the pond takes up most of the image. It looks as though there may be a bit of a tree off frame to our right that is Leaning a bit over into frame, there's we can see some branches, but not, not the stump of the tree, not the trunk of the tree. And then there's just the other side of the pond in the distance. There aren't any people. It appears as though there's a bit of a tree line on the other side, and beyond the tree line there may be the roof of a perhaps two-story building, like a visitor center or something. And then on the left side of the frame, on the opposite beach, there are uh, what look like some form of palm tree, but short ones. And then on the very far right side of frame, very, very small, you have to zoom in, I can see a car. It's hard to tell whether that car is parked or in motion. Now, the image itself, uh, especially in the color of the trees on the other side of the pond, is very degraded. And I can't tell if it's because the photo resolution wasn't very good or, or what. I would say it's a filter, but it doesn't seem like the foreground is especially affected. So it might just be the camera. And then beyond the tree line, there's a what seems to be a relatively overcast sky. But there are uh, hard shadows on the bench, so the clouds are just in the distance. The pond itself is... The pond itself is placid, and there's nothing on it to see. No ducks, or birds, or turtles, or things you might expect to see in a pond. Perhaps they've all been eaten by the dangerous alligator crab. The caption here says, A really nice walk around this pond. Thank you, MSF or MS Fun Sun. Never would have found this place without you mentioning it. Smiley emoji. Well, isn't that nice? Our next entry comes from bench.jp. I think we might have had bench.jp in the first episode. This would be in Japan, and in fact, the description is also in Japanese. However, there are a couple of hashtags in English including bench, chair. 
relax, happy, tree, Tokyo, and Nihonbashi. It's probably safe to say that this is in Tokyo, and it certainly is an urban photo. This is the plaza of some kind of uh, city building outside of perhaps a shop. The uh, sort of background building looks to be of a cement modern design, but there's a sort of a cube-shaped smaller building sticking out of it that almost looks like it's knit. It has holes in a pattern, like a diagonal pattern all across it, and at about eye level there are tiny show windows that appear to be just shelves, like you can't see into the store. They're just individual product show windows. And that's it, you can't see into the store at all, just this big black or gray surface with tiny little windows. And I think I might be able to see a handbag in one of these windows. Now the angle that we're at is that we're on the edge of this courtyard, so we can't see the storefront to see what kind of store it is, and there are slightly larger show windows there, and perhaps a sign that says what the store is, but I think it's just some a cloth awning. And then on the top edge on one side of the box there is a big red, what almost looks like a big like a giant Coca-Cola cap, but that's not what it is, and I can't read it or see what it says. In any case, we're in some kind of shopping district, and the ground is just flat cement, tiled flat cement, and there is a tree that is planted in the foreground of the frame, in kind of a planter, and it's got some uh, wooden... Uh, supports thicker than the sticks you would normally see to hold up a sapling and this is not a sapling it is uh, at least up to the, the the second story of height for this building and then in its planter there are more bushes and then toward camera from there um, there's a low rectangular slab that's in three pieces like like as if it was a stone log and I imagine that this is what the photographer is considering a bench but I don't know if it's a bench it looks too small I think a child could sit on it and it doesn't have the telltale hallmarks of a bench, such as a back, a clear seat, or clear uh, uh, legs. That's not to say that it's not a bench, but it almost looks like just a piece of curb. I would certainly be lying if I said that I, myself, on occasion, did not take photographs of objects that could be benches, but probably aren't. It's less common of an issue in cities, although it might be a ledge or something sticking out of a building. But more often you find it in nature, where there is a part of a rock or a boulder or a tree stump that it is just somehow a natural place to sit down. Well, maybe we'll just have to let this one go. Our next entry is from Bergen's Vesta Banker. And the location is Bergen, Sandviken. This one uh, I like for a lot of reasons. To begin with, I can see that this person uses a similar rating system to the one that I use on my own account. They have, in whatever language this is, numbers for comfort, 
design an Utsicht. They've given Utsicht a 3, Comfort a 3, and Design a 5. Well, now let's look at the image. It is unusually a letterboxed image. In this case, the top and bottom bars are white, and they complement the overall whiteness of the image. The photo is taken on a city street that has a gentle downhill slope to it, and the sidewalk has a gentle downhill slope. There are two and three story apartment buildings that line the sidewalk, and each has a set of steps that goes up to a front door. And uh, the one closest to the edge of frame on the right is a cream color, but the other three that we can see, or four maybe, that we can see in the, as, the, as it moves to a vanishing point are more of a white color. And then the stairs are white, and the window frames are white. But each house has a, uh, like a wrought iron, like bolted onto the side deck on the second floor. From here, it's hard to see how much furniture they have. It looks as though the second house furthest down may have its own bench on a balcony. Now here's the fun part. There are all these white buildings, but where's the bench? If you look closely, very tiny in frame, near the steps of the center house, there is a small white bench up against the building right before the steps. And it is the same white as the house. You can blink and miss it. And uh, it, you could almost imagine that this was just placed here, besides being the perfect white. But what's interesting is that if you look closely, and you really do have to zoom in to see it, this is a small wooden bench with maybe three or four slats for the seat, and then two thick slats for the back and two thin slats in between. But here's the thing. The legs on the right side of the bench have been trimmed just enough, or sanded down, just enough to make the bench flat with the edge of the house and not the downward sloping sidewalk. So if you were to sit on that bench, you would be on the horizontal plane of the home that you're sitting in front of. I think that's pretty clever. And then otherwise there's not much to remark on. It's a light cloudy blue sky and there is a traffic sign of some variety further down the further down the, the road. And on either side of the bench there are small windows, presumably for a basement. And then on the other side of one of those windows to the right is a planter with some pretty dead looking flowers of some kind in it. Whoever lives here definitely needs to uh, take some care. Although I see the neighbors have some planters, and those flowers have uh, only a little bit of color, too. So maybe it's just that it's winter time. Our next bench is from Jerjerp Benches. And another underscore between Jerp and Benches. This one is at Cementerio Sur which, according to the hashtags, is in Madrid. And this one's got quite the, quite the hashtag game going. I won't read them all, but they include benches in the park, 
benches in parks, photography, photo of the day, best bench views, bench every day, bench views, Indo underscore benches, Spanish bench, Spanish benches, European benches, European bench, benches, bench, bench seat, bank lover, benches of the world unite, addicted to benches, empty benches, benches of Instagram, benches around the world, benches around Madrid, and so on. This is a fine photo. It's pretty close up on featuring the bench. In fact, this is sort of a twin benches. At first glance, it's even hard to notice. So it's about bench height, and the benches are sort of forcefully coming at us, into, uh, out, almost out of the frame, like jumping out like 3D. And the, the, the first bench that we see is, is a very elegant, uh, thin bench. The, the legs in the frame are very thin metal with like f fleur de lis, like curly cues that um, wrap to make the, the feet of the bench almost in like a squid-like way. And they also wrap up to hold up the, the slats of the back. And the slats are very thin, and they're spaced relatively far apart. There's about nine of them. And then the seat is relatively flat with a little bit of a taper at the front, where there's another seven slats. And the bench itself is, including the legs, is painted a very beige cream color, or it appears to be a very beige cream color. And that cream color, uh, in the way that the, the photograph resolves, is almost the same color as the uh, sidewalk, which is a diagonally tiled sort of sandstone sidewalk. And as those two things drift towards the, the vanishing in the back of the photo, they almost blend together. Like it's almost hard to tell the difference between the bench and the sidewalk. Just off of the sidewalk behind the bench, you can see uh, bouquets of flowers and um, the edges of a, of a monument of a of a, perhaps a burial site or a mausoleum. And the, the flowers are fresh uh, purple and white and blue flowers. And there's a dedication. And the sun is super harsh. It's very bright and it's coming from the sort of top right of frame. And it's coming down and it's shining through the bench and it's casting the shadows of both the back and seat of the bench onto the sidewalk almost like coming towards us and if you again if you just blink you'd almost miss it but there is a second bench behind the first bench back to back like uh like if it was in a crime movie, you might have one person sit down on one side and one person sit down on the other, and they pretend they don't know each other. And they'd talk about, you know, the plans to uh, assassinate the premier or smuggle the microfilm, something like that. In any case, there's this other bench, and it's a totally different style of bench. And because it's existing almost entirely in the shadow of this other bench, it's even hard to tell what it's made out of. But I'm going to do my best in very sharp contrast to our original bench. This one has thick legs and uh, thick arms holding up the back. And the back is one thick piece of wood and the seat is one thick piece of wood and they look to be somewhat finished but 
very, very worn out. In fact, the legs and the, and the back posts almost look like they are also made out of wood, like they stylistically look like tree branches. But the, uh, the, the background legs on the other end of the bench have almost identical shapes, so I think they're metal. And I think that they've probably been forged to look like tree branches. And then the, the thick pieces of wood are just bolted to it. And like I said, it's almost invisible behind this very elegant bench. I think this is a very good photo. Now, further on in the distance, just towards the vanishing point, there are uh, some trees and uh, another bench in the distance that doesn't match our hero bench at all. And then what looks to be maybe somebody's left a walker in the path of the sidewalk? Or no, it's just a, a cheap looking chair that's been left out. Well, lots of places to sit, I suppose, at Cementerio Sur. I feel like today's theme might just happen to be hidden benches. The next bench is from Park Benches, and I guess another theme today is underscores. Although I suppose we had one from Park Benches earlier. But since this seems to be following a theme, I don't mind having a second appearance from Park Benches. This one is from St. Mary Catholic Church, presumably also in Melbourne. Now, this is, um, this photo is clearly focusing on the benches, and it is at the, just outside the entrance of this Catholic church, where there is a ramp that is uh, going up into the church, but we are at such an angle that we are uh, facing perpendicular to the ramp, and we can't actually see the entrance to the church because of the stone uh, pillar that is coming out from it. And the church is made of a very clear relief, uh, rectangular stone blocks. It almost looks like there's the image might be a little over-sharpened because of how much definition there is in the, uh, in the sort of like grouting. And then the rest of the trims of the church are a very pronounced cream color that almost don't go together. And then the ramp has a uh, metal railing, a modern metal railing that doesn't match the rest of the aesthetic. And then uh, sort of the outer edges around this photo, there's the photo is taken from what may be a, a gravel lot. And the walkway going up to the ramp is, looks like it might be cement, but it's not very well kept. And there's weeds everywhere. Now, once again, we can't, you look and you almost can't see the bench. And in this case, there's a bench uh, on our side of the railing from the ramp. And it is a old, worn out, just maybe was once nice in its day bench. But now the, uh, the metal ends of the bench that are that form the the feet and the 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 back posts and the armrests are all just they look rusted out and the seat at the bench which is too uh, it looks like uh, well sanded planks uh, they look just worn out too. And then the, uh, the back has a, a wooden rectangular border, and then the, the, the most of the back is a lattice design. But the wood, again, just looks worn out. And it's interesting because all of these worn-out colors of the bench really do just match the, 
worn out look of the ground and the worn out look of the edge of the church and it almost fits perfectly in between two uh, posts of the railing so at first glance you don't even see it but this gets better the description for the photo says a couple of old benches away parishioners at an old church in Axdale. Well, there's another bench in the photo. And sure enough, there is. If you look behind the ramp and slightly obscured by the railing, up against the stone wall of the church is another one of these dilapidated old benches. It's like the, it's a brother or sister of the bench that we see in the foreground. But what's interesting is that it's up against the wall, which means that it's maybe getting less sunlight and more moisture because it's a much darker looking version of the same bench. It looks like it's maybe hasn't lost its finishing entirely or else it's completely waterlogged and dark from the wet. And all of this sort of tone of dilapidation fits with the gray sky in the distant background. Although there are some nice lush looking trees. Honestly, if the church itself didn't have a fresh coat of cream paint on its trimming, the whole thing would look pretty run down. But that said, it's still a pretty good photo of benches. And as I like to say, it's good to see benches of all stripes, not just the pretty ones. Now we head to the forest, where the bench chronicles, no underscores, are taking us to Isle Stone Meadows. A-Y-L-E, Stone Meadows. It looks to be maybe winter time, and there are trees that are bare of leaves. However, the surrounding area is relatively thick with weeds and dirt, and there is a trail in the background. And there is what appears to be A very small bench. It doesn't have a back. It almost looks like it would be a hitching post for a very, very, very small horse. And it looks like it's even partially overgrown with weeds. And you can't see the seat of it very well because we're probably maybe 15 feet away or maybe even a little further. You know, the wide angle exaggerates. I will read now the description that says, uh, At is he what? And I decided that Cher in Clueless would deem this the Monet of benches. Pretty from far away, but close up, it's a big old mess. I still like it, though. A bit of rustic charm never hurt anybody. Well, lucky for us, there are two more photos in this series. And what I can do is shed some light on the mystery of this bench's construction. Oh my... Yes, when we go closer, we can see that this is, this is an X bench. There are, oh, it's almost too horrible to describe. So, there are rectangular wooden posts, and it looks as though this bench is it a bench? Once had 
two slats of wood that were the seat. There's no evidence of any back. So it would perhaps be a one-person bench. But one of the two wooden beams is, is just gone. There's a tiny piece of it left on one side and on the other just exposed nails that show that the wood just must have rotted away. And it seems as though the post itself was either, you know, the legs were either individual wood blocks or a handful of them that were secured together, but where the beam of the seat is missing, it looks like the center is rotted out from the, from the leg. And there's maybe some moss growing inside of it. Yeah, I think there's moss growing inside. And the, the wooden benches of the seat themselves were not just nailed onto the posts. In fact, they weren't nailed onto the posts at all. There were small, like, two-by-four type pieces of wood that were used to hold the large nails or screws for the bench. And they were, they themselves were secured to the legs. So if you could imagine that if you were at bench level, there would be this kind of like T-shape post that the seat was rested on, um, on two sides. But it is, a, it is a mess. And it looks like this construction, because this is some very dubious construction, uh, it looks like on the ground in between the two posts was another piece of wood of indiscriminate carpentry that was maybe put there so that the, the posts wouldn't collapse inward on themselves from weight. It's so hard to tell. It looks like... Perhaps it's an amateur design, but it's... I mean, somebody put work into this. Somebody put work into this a very long time ago. And judging by the look of the bench, they've probably gone too. And it's just, it's overgrown with weeds. Well, I'll have to hand it to the Bench Chronicles. I do agree that a bit of rustic charm never hurt anybody. Although it is a little bit tough on the psyche. I appreciate it. I enjoy benches, as I have said, of different varieties. But this one truly is a horror show. Well, I was thinking about ending with that bench, but it was kind of a downer to finish on. Oh, this person also has a rating system that uh, is similar to the one that I use. The rating system is called The Benchmarks. Comfort. I assume these are out of five. Comfort. One. I guess you can't give a zero. View. 4.2. Aesthetic. 3.6. He likes the rustic. He definitely likes the rustic. Sturdiness. 1.5. I have to tell you, listener, that I think that 1.5 sturdiness is generous. This looks like it would collapse if you sat on it. Necessity, 3. I'm not sure what necessity rating means. Maybe just the need to have the bench? Hmm. Well, if it's a 3, it probably ought to be rebuilt or replaced. And finally, overall, 2.7 stars. There are also a handful of hashtags here. Bench, benches, benchstagram, benches of Instagram, Islestone Meadows, Islestone, 
Leicester, Midlands, Travel Photography, Woodland, Rustic, Pretty, and Nature Photography. Well, I'm starting to get tired, but I don't want to end on a downer, so let's do one more bench. Our final bench comes from Mine Bonkerel, and the image is taken in Habak. This one is possibly the prettiest of all the pictures so far. It is uh, situated behind an old stone support bench. And you can see deep into the distance. The bench sits at a T in a crossroads. And there is a vast valley that gently swoops up to rolling hills in the distance. And the main road crosses from left to right. And then the intersecting road travels away from the bench to the vanishing point on the right side of frame. And it's really quite beautiful. It looks like it might be farmland. It's not even clear why this bench is here. There are no visible signs of a, for example, bus stop. There is no fence. There is no clear driveway. And because we are behind the bench, we really can't tell what the nature is of the property that the bench sits on. It just appears to be as though somebody just left it there. But a bench of this heft, because the back support and the uh, single block leg features are thick stone. This is not a light bench. Nobody could have just pulled over and left it here. So the road going out to the vanishing point on the left side has what might be a, an electrical pole or probably a street light. And then the left side of the road has uh, like fence posts lining it and a bit further down along with the fence posts are a set of about six in a row uh, trees bare of their leaves. It's a very beautiful autumn looking image. And beyond the trees it looks as though there is a more of a loop up to the mountains and uh, it, it's very difficult to see far enough in the distance that the trees are obstructing what might be another road or could even possibly be a freeway, but it's very difficult to tell. And then just beyond those fence posts and the trees, again, it's just a beautiful field um, that actually looks pretty well kept. It could be a golf course perhaps but the image is almost too country like to be a golf course it doesn't seem like the the location itself doesn't look golf course like but again it, it could be a golf course there doesn't seem to be any other clear purpose for the landscaping and there does appear to be a path, although I don't see any telltale sand traps or uh, poles or anything, or even the lights you might think would be around the edge of the course. And this side by the bench, although there are fence posts, there isn't clearly a fence here. So who knows? Now, around the bench is 
a lot of uh, grass growing. This doesn't look very well kept. It doesn't seem like the bench is maintained. It's got a lot of character. The seat is five wooden planks and the back is another four. They look like they might even be unfinished. And the stone is speckled and, uh, and old as well. It looks like, a, like the speckling of a quail's egg. And then beyond the trees and beyond the mountains, uh, the exposure of this photo is very nice. You can see um, just a great mass of puffy clouds that are a little bit on the dark side. And perhaps what may be beams of sunlight uh, shining down in front of them. It is a very nice photograph. It has a very cold feeling, but it's a soothing cold feeling. And I should add as well that this one has a very wide aspect ratio. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't have uh, any letterboxing like one of the ones we looked at earlier. And the light itself, even though we're on the the shadow side of the bench, uh, there's still plenty of fill light on the back of the bench. It's a very light contrast. This reminds me of one of my own favorite photos of a, of a similarly aged bench that I took a photo of at Port Ellen on Isla in Scotland. But in any case, this is a good bench to end on, rather than the frightening, sad bench that we could have ended on. Now then, if you're still awake, do you know how many benches we've looked at? The answer is nine. Okay, well that was a very good number of benches for one sitting. Thank you for joining me for this scroll. Did you like hearing about benches? What do you like to scroll before going to bed at night? Well, that's where we'll leave it for this episode. It's time for me to get some shut-eye myself. I hope you're not hearing this and have been inadequately rambled to rest. I will now leave you with these parting words. Corn. Base. Better. Loving, small, retire, behavior, curvy, explain, deep, optimal, and fix. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Ryan and we'll meet again.